Hi, I'm Gary, welcome to the channel and welcome back if you've been here before. Now today is the fifth in the series of videos I made coming from my trip to Airfix last week, but today it's not Airfix that's under the spotlight, it's their partner company, Humbrol. Now if you enjoy this video, and I hope you do, please remember to say so with a quick like on the thumbs up button down there. And of course, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you want to do anything a bit more concrete to support the channel. All the links are in the information box below to my partner programs. So on with the presentation then, and here we have Jamie Buchanan, who's the Head of Strategic Delivery at Humbrol. One of the things that we were very conscious of is um, there seemed to be um, a lack of um, product development um, within Humble. It's very easy um, for Humble to sort of sit to the side um, and just be sort of one of these service brands um, to the likes of Airfix. Um, but we wanted to sort of try and um, push this onwards um, as a brand. So um, we started to look at the paints. Um, and we started to look at the market and, and noticed that um, acrylic paints are starting to become more and more prevalent um, in, in the modelling um, industry um, as well as in retail as well. And we started to really notice that in our figures as well. When we started looking at our census figures and our sales figures, we could start to see um, our acrylics really starting to rise up. Um, and then equally, almost monthly now, we're getting um, new legislation that comes out um, across all of our products. Um, but specifically on Humble and enamel paints um, and obviously with the, the varying different uh, compounds and um, ingredients that go into, res into sorry, enamels um, in particular, it's becoming harder and harder. Um, there's uh, REACH and CLP in particular um, are really starting to, to ban um, all sorts of things. I mean, we, we got told the other day um, there's a, a piece of legislation in paints where the level of arsenic is 10 times lower than the level of arsenic that you're allowed to put in baby, baby food. Um, so that, that's how mad some of this, this legislation is that you have to comply with. Um, so um, you can eat 10 times higher level of arsenic in baby food than you can um, in, in paints. Um, so um, what, we, what we've started to do, um, as you would have seen in some of the communications, is that our acrylic range um, has started to expand. Um, when it went over to dropper bottles, um, and Daryl was working on that, we started off with an initial core range of 80 colours. Um, we then identified um, more colours that were needed. Um, there, there was um, cockpit green was, was one of the ones that everyone was screaming at us from day one when, when George and I started to look at this. Um, so that was sort of went in straight away. Um, and what we've done is we've, we've increased the range to 151 colours now. Um, amongst those colours, it allows us to do some, some, some quite big um, groupings of colours um, into sort of the RAF and the USAAF and stuff. Um, and that's sort of what we're going to start to really work on now and pushing those groups of colours um, and, and colour packs. Um, going back to the, the bit of, sort of product development, because um, obviously this is just range enhancements, um, we then started to work with our paint supplier um, and working on what we call Gen 2. Um, and we tried to identify um, some, some areas that we needed to improve on. Um, we worked with a, a number of different people, Paramjet helped us out loads actually, um, trying to identify some areas that, that the paints just weren't quite up to, to where they should be, we felt. Um, so we started with Gen 2. Um, we're not going to stop there, we're going to continue uh, working with the formulations on, on acrylics, um, trying to push that further and further forward um, and at some stage Gen 3 will be out and then Gen 4 and just constantly um, developing those. When we started to test these, um, to make sure that we were happy with them, we did a little sort of swatch test um, here, um, and you can see we, we, we didn't have exactly the right shade um, uh, with AK, but we just did a little sort of swatch test in, in our workshop um, with the Gen 2 paints, and we were really pleased with the performance of that um, against some of our competitors. Um, we uh, improved the reduce, uh, reduction in separation. Um, we've improved the, the airbrushing coverage and we're actually working on at the moment, and I spoke to someone about an hour ago who's testing some stuff for us, um, the, uh, an improved um, acrylic thinner as well to go with the drop bottle. So when airbrushing, um, the 2 and 2 will sort of work better, the Gen 2 will work better with, with, our, current, um, or with our new uh, airbrush thinners. Um, and then uh, improved um, surface adhesion as well to the plastic, and that was what I was trying to demonstrate there. When we're bringing in new colours, um, we're mainly doing them in matte colours now, because obviously it then gives you the choice of uh, finish um, once you start to use um, the, the, the sort of 
uh, varnishes um, on top of that. So you know, if you want to gloss, you can use a gloss um, varnish and the like. The enamel paints, um, as I said at the beginning, um, when we started to look at the colours and the trends in the market, um, how our sales were, were performing, um, colours, which are our most popular colours, through to sort of some of um, the, the less popular colours, um, we, we started to look at the enamel range. Um, and what we've done is we've focused on um, our key 80 colours um, based on data, um, our, our sales data, and then equally um, some feedback. There were some colours actually that trended slightly lower, um, but we brought them in because um, we knew that they were, were needed for certain models. Um, but these are, these are generally the core colours that are needed um, within the enamel range, knowing that more and more of the market is going over to acrylics um, and, and our competitors are sort of battering at, at, at that acrylic part of the market. So we want to make sure that we, we remain current as a brand. Um, Again, part of the uh, product development um, is, is new products coming into the range, so it's not all about improving what we currently got, um, which we've done so far with the paints. Um, so we've brought some new items in. We've got two weathering packs. Um, one thing that we are conscious on, on Humble is, Humble's great for plastic model kits, but it has huge potential either side of that sort of part of the market as well. Um, so we've got all of our standard weathering powders, but we've done two small packs here um, where we're starting to push those uh, over into um, maybe the dioramas, um, uh, the war gaming, uh, and then equally model railways. Um, all of our model railway customers are starting to really um, pick up on the, on the, um, the range that Humble offer as well. Um, we've got a new product, um, a chipping effect, um, that's just come out. Um, we've just received the stock in the last week and a half, I'd say. Um, and then we've also got another picture here, but we've got a thing called Smart Mud, um, tub sort of about yay big, um, of like a racing mud, um, so when you're building your dioramas, especially for, for wheeled vehicles, um, it makes a really nice finish. And that can be painted on and finished um, with, with some of our weathering powders and, and washes and the like. One of the things that, uh, going back to where sort of the brand can go sort of left and right, um, of, of where it currently sat at, sort of aimed um, mainly at sort of plastic model kits, is um, the 3D market. Um, 3D printers have been around in industry for a long time. Martin and I can remember using them as early as probably 94, 95 um, here um, at Hornby. Um, we were using an agency. Um, but 3D printers in, in sort of the general public, and everyone talking about it, has sort of really sort of started to, to pick up in the last five years. Um, Humble's a big household brand, um, and we felt that we could offer a 3D printer into the marketplace, um, into our retail channels, um, to allow just the general consumer to, to have a 3D printer at home. Um, so this will be um, it's a small unit, about yay big. Um, it looks quite nice. It's not a big, ugly piece of um, sort of engineering um, uh, apparatus that you, you wouldn't be unhappy to have sat in your home office. Um, the bed is 100 millimeters cube, um, so you can make sort of something about yay big. Um, the quality is okay um, for, for a 200 pounds retail printer, um, but this is more about allowing the general public um, to create something. I took, I took it home. We take a lot of things in, for granted um, in, in our industry, seeing 3D models and 3D prints um, is just a general thing. I took it home and showed my wife and my children and they were amazed. I only printed something <coughs> simple, it was just something very generic. Um, they were amazed within sort of 20 minutes they had something in their hand that didn't exist in this world prior to that. It was just on a spool of plastic um, and, and they were blown away and oh, this is amazing. Um, that's what we're trying to do really here with Humble. So it's mainly, mainly not aimed at the plastic model kit market, this is sort of aimed at left or right of that. Um, just being able to do 3D modelling um, and then create a 3D um, print um, and then use some of our other products um, to, to finish it off. These are some of the things that we've, um, we've been able to print successfully, just so some random stuff. Um, I, I printed this, this was quite clever, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but my son took it into a, a physics class um, at, his, um, at his senior school um, just to show you the two parts don't actually touch but they support each other. Um, this is a small figurine that I printed um, and then painted with some Airfix um, and you can get an idea of the size of it against um, one of our small drop bottles. Um, so that's ideal um, for the model railway market. Um, you have to create little figurines on your platforms and the like. Um, this is a, a really simple little cap that you can screw onto the top of your mastic gun. So it's that type of stuff. It's not just all aimed at, at models. Um, little man for your uh, model railway right through to some household stuff that you might want to print. Um, through to just some fun stuff um, that, that we're printing out. Um, so yeah, so we're quite excited um, uh, about that.
you have a price? 200 pounds. Around 200 yeah. pounds. Yeah. Right. So that's your, that's your budget yes. entry level. That's retail, yes. Yeah. 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 That, that's really where we want to pitch it. It's, it's, it's a nice looking item. It's to get people into 3D printing. Yeah, you've got a 3D printer at home. Um, I, I, I sort of talk about it here, about um, when, when printers came out at home, um, and, and I remember us getting um, a printer at home, and it was like a dot matrix printer. We were amazed we could print out a letter at home. Um, that's sort of where this is at. Um, yeah, it's, it's not some of the real high-end um, stuff. Um, and then equally, you can get a Dremel and an Ultimaker and stuff like that for for a thousand pounds. This is two hundred pounds, but it makes nice nice three D prints. Um, as you can see here, um, and there, there's plenty of um, yeah, you can see here. There's plenty of. Uh, of um, portals that you can go and download 3D models. If you're not a 3D CAD designer, um, you can download plenty of other stuff. Uh, and then equally, Microsoft offer a really nice 3D, 3D modeling um, piece of software, as well as um, things like Onshape and stuff, which is very easy to use. What sort of resolution does it have? Um, special resolution? I think it's uh, point, point 0.4 of a millimeter, okay. um, off the top of my head. Um, so, and it's using standard 1.75 um, filament. And the material, is it sandable or fillable? Well, it would be fillable after this, yes, obviously, yeah, yeah. for the it, it is sandable. sandable. It's PLA, um, okay. so it's a, it's, a, it's a natural resin um, that comes from plant extract. Um, cool. But yeah, um, this, this I didn't really trim, um, to be true, but it was so small that I didn't really need um, filling or anything like that. Um, you can see on this one, I should have put some bits in, which I can do, I can go grab them off my, my windowsill. Um, but this, you can just about see the, um, sort of the laminations as it builds up. Um, part of the skill in, in 3D printing um, is working out the orientation of your part. You can change the orientation. Sorry, this does come with its own piece of software as well um, to, to allow you to orientate the, the model and then play around with the slicing levels as well and the quality of it. You, yeah, something like this you can just bash out at yeah, simple quality. Um, the little man there, you might want to print at a slight angle, a little higher resolution um, to get the best resolution um, model. How accessible is it for a, a new beginner? Because there are three D printers out there which is quite fat to get them leveled. Yep. Whereas there's other ones which do it themselves. So this doesn't do it itself, but basically, the um, level. Basically, um, there's a button on the back which brings this down to this bed. Um, there's four screws. On here, when you buy it, you get a small leveling instruction. That's George designed it. Was it five steps or something like that? Four steps. Yeah, I think it's just five, it's five steps, and you pretty much just slip that in right underneath, just so it pinches the nozzle, mm -hmm. and then you know that's absolutely perfect. You do that in all four corners, um, just by adjusting with the screws, and that's it. That'll get you the best print. Just at one time. One time. And is the print bed fixed, or can you remove it? So uh, on here is a magnetic sheet. So then you take the magnetic sheet off, flex it, it pops it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the bed. You get a spatula with it as well, so. You, some models you can just pop off. Yeah, if you're doing it right, you shouldn't have to use it. No, no, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's slightly porous as well. Um, just to, so um, we, we've had, so we tried lots and lots of printers actually um, when we were looking at suppliers, um, and some of them were really susceptible to, to grease from your fingers, so then the, 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 the base bed um, wouldn't stick, but we, we've not had really any problems with this. Every now and again, you might need to just wipe it over with a little bit of alcohol and just take any sort of dust or debris that you might have on there. Other than that, we've printed lots and lots of these. Will you be able to change the size of the nozzle? Um, I don't know, to be truthful. I've not asked that. Um, it, it's a heated nozzle. Um, yeah. uh, I really, really don't know. Okay. So, so we, we've spoken all, all sort of about this. Um, so one of the base files that you get with this um, is, a, is a small um, clip, uh, that, like, a, like a peg, that's got humble bit of on it. Um, but yes, stuff like that. Um, on the website, you can then go there monthly and, and download the latest file, stands for, for certain aircrafts yeah. and, and all sorts of, um, yeah. Um, that's definitely yeah, way forward. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of opportunities. Um, and then likewise for, for all the other brands. Who I, mean. I, I don't think we'd drop the humble brand. You don't think you would? No. no. Linking it or making it Airfix would, would narrow its opportunities. I think. Do you really think? Well, Air, Airfix is all about plastic model kits, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and, and the opportunities are, are and, and its, it's current use, um, humble, is, is far broader than, than just plastic model kits. Um. The humble brand will not go. It won't. And, and I completely agree with Jamie. It is there as an accessory brand to our others mm. in, in the market and and other modelling brands available out there. Um, you know, Jamie, Jamie mentioned the, the challenges that the business has faced over the last 
uh, 18 months or so uh, yeah. with you know, sadly losing individuals that knew a lot about the brand and mm. a number of challenges that the industry has faced in general. Mm. Um, and I think sadly Humbrol has just um, had a really bad time of it. Um, mm. It's down to the guys now mm. to, um, to turn it around. I, I um, fully support what the guys are doing with the acrylic range. I've seen them myself, I think they're really good. Mm. Um, and I just think it's, it, we've just got to chip away at that. Yeah. And at some point, you know, people's mindsets of humble mm. will hopefully change. Um, but, but that's what, that's the biggest challenge we have now. It is. The, the, guys have now. Is, so, the bar is quite low for humble, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah, so, so we know. need to raise that, and that's, yeah. that's what we're doing. Yeah. I think that goes back to the bit that I was saying earlier, that humble hasn't had any product development done to it for, mm. for a long period of time. Um, yeah, the, the current paint formulation, when it was brought back to the UK, was 10 years ago, probably, um, maybe 11. Ten. Um, <coughs> and, and nothing happened until fairly recently when, we, when we've gone to this, this Gen 2, where we've sort of put a bit of a focus to tr try and work out what we yeah. can do. Um, interestingly, um, when we started this journey, we asked a number of people, uh, exactly you took your question, okay, why don't you use Humble? Oh, it's, it's not that good. Okay, well, let, let's test. And, and we, we got these guys to test, and let's test current Humbrol versus others and tell me why this is so much better or why this is so poor and there wasn't this obvious thing that oh, it's because of uh, or it's because of that so they couldn't put their finger on it and, and, and some of the time it was like, it's not actually that bad it's, it's, it's part of it is a legacy sort of forethought of, of what you're expecting out of Humbrol probably pre the 10 years when it, when it originally was changed um, because there was a period where the, the quality of the paint was, was not great yeah. um, so, so the changes that we've done um, to go to Gen 2, um, we've done, um, and, and we're very pleased with. We're not stopping there, we're going to continue. Um, uh, and, and like I said, um, we, we want to launch Gen 3 and then Gen 4 and keep on pushing this. Um, because we, we are in this industry, um, our sales recognise that we're in this industry. Um, our sales from, from the, the volumes that we sell of Humble, um, you know, we, 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 don't see, we haven't seen a decline in, in our sales um, from Humble, um, either acrylics or enamels. Um, we've seen the trends change, um, where we start to see more onus over towards a, a acrylics um, versus enamels, but that's going to be natural, um, because as, as the younger guys coming into the industry and the older guys are, are leaving the industry, and, and the hobby, I should call it, um, you're naturally going to see more, um, more leaning towards, towards acrylics. So, so they're formulated, um, yes, it's all made and filled in the UK. Um, yeah. Uh, it's done in a couple of plant, a couple of places because the the paint is made in one place and then filled in, yeah, in a slightly yeah, different yeah. place. But yes, it's all it's all UK okay. based. Um. I've heard from a lot of people in a lot of comments and a lot of forums and places saying enamel paint from Humbrol is gone. No, no it's not. Um, so, so as I said right at the beginning, there, there was some CLP and reach changes. Um, that caused the industry um, an issue um, with, with some of the, the compounds and the formulations within the animals. Um, we had a supply chain halt, um, and then, then we restarted it, and that's where we've done the, the range adjustment. But animals are still there. One of the things that um, makes it harder is the period of time they now give us to make the changes. Um, so a new piece, of, they start talking about it, and then you've got to make the change within a, a certain period of time. Some of our shades and then the batches that you have to buy the sell through is so long that you can't be reactive enough to, to make those changes uh, and that was part of the, the reduction in the, the range but enamels mm -hmm. are still here um, within the humble range. So to meet that sort of compliance it's die down, get it back yes. and then come yes. back yes. Yes. Yeah. So I guess the big takeaway really for a lot of people is that the enamel range is definitely not being shut down. Humbro are going to continue with their enamels that's good for a lot of people who like painting with them. I personally don't like them at all. I prefer acrylics, but I know there's a lot of you out there who prefer enamels for various reasons. So that's a good thing. Enamels are here to stay. Um, the Generation 2 acrylics, I'll give them a go. I'll see what they're like. I don't use humble acrylics generally. I tend to use mainly Vallejo for airbrushing, although I do use a lot of humble for painting. So paintbrushing, we'll see. Um, what I will definitely be having a go at are some of the new uh, dusting powders, the aging and rusting and weathering powders. And that's because, of course, 
they gave us some. So I'll be building a kit and then using these to have a go and see what we can do with that. Also, this chipping solution that they've just released. Um, I've never used chipping solution before. I'll give it a go to see what happens. And of course, at some point, I'll have a use for the smart mud here. Um, it looks a, as appealing as its name suggests. Um, I'll be using that for a diorama at some point. Pity they didn't give us some sand texture, but mud will be fine when I make my Laffley truck, for example. I was interested to hear about 3D printers. A um, bit out of the blue, that one. Wasn't expecting to hear that. And do you know what? I'm really just not sure. Um, I'm not sure about 3D printing in general in the domestic market. As a product, 3D printing is brilliant. It's an incredible thing and it's got so much of a future I can't begin to imagine it. But in the home at 200 quid, I, I don't know. It's not high enough resolution to make bits for your airfix kits, you know, replacement pilots or whatever. Um, it's big enough to, good enough for uh, models maybe for your dioramas for trains, and that's grand. Maybe it'd be good for diorama pieces, you know, walls and sides of buildings or signposts and things like that, that you'd normally otherwise be buying in resin, probably. But is it going to sustain a market, even at £200? Or is it one of those things that, you know, you buy, you set up, everyone's really excited, you print off, I don't know, a few Yoda figures and then some clips for your, hold your kits together while they dry. And then the the feed wire runs out and uh, can I be bothered getting a new one? Um, do I need to know how to do 3D design? Is it really something that's got legs to a large part of the market? And I'm not sure it does. I, I'm really not sure it does. 3D printing itself is definitely here to stay. But at this level and this price point, maybe it's just too mass market. You know, I really, I really do hope Humber will make a success of this. Um, I just admire them for trying to reinvent the brands. They're doing great work on the paints. I know they're putting a lot of time and effort into, into that sort of part of the market. But and this just seems quite a big step in a new area. And I don't know how much the Humber name is going to be associated with 3D printing as opposed to um, paints and other products like that. But good luck to them. If they make it, fantastic. Anyway, um, that's all for today. All the videos now from the Airfix trip are available on my channel, so have fun watching those. Like them if you do, with the thumbs up symbol. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Small logo down there in the right corner. Don't cost you anything. Helps me absolutely enormously. In any case, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.